session 8 of the book of Exodus and we are in chapter number 6. So we ended yesterday with the uh, first verse, Then Yahuwah said to Moses, Now shall you see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go, and with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. And I just want to say here, we just need to wait. We need to be quiet, be still, and know that I am God. Moses and Israel, stop stressing. There's a lot that you are going to go through. Yes, you're going to be bent under slavery. And yes, Pharaoh is going to be hard upon you. And, and you've been through so much already, but now you will see. And remember everything we learn from the old, ancient, dusty pages of Genesis and Exodus and Leviticus is something that is relevant in your life today. And, and I've shown you how the Pharaoh Egyptian sun god system is still remaining today, just in another form. They just look different and they drive around in limousines, but the Pharaoh is still bending this world under slavery. Um, and not only economical slavery, but religious slavery. And uh, we all bend to a system and we all are under the burden of hard work and having to, um, you know, reveal everything. You have to reveal everything you do in your work because taxes has to be deducted. And there's, there's nothing you can do just for yourself. If you want to sell something, you always have to... Um, reveal it and it has to go through the bookkeeping systems and there's taxes involved and VAT and income tax and nothing you do is is free from scrutiny of this system and at the end of the day God says this system is going to come to an end this whole economic um, trading world power it, it this all is going to come to an end and we will go back to, to living with God like Adam and Chava did in the Garden of Eden. That is his kingdom and that is his rule. And there it says, every man will sit under his own fig tree and he will eat his own figs without having to um, answer to anybody about that. Nobody's going to come and take your figs away. You are going to eat the labor of your hands. This is God's kingdom. And he says, just wait, now you are going to see. And verse 2, Elohim then spoke to Moses. And he says, I am yod Hey vav Hey. I am Yahuwah. And I appeared to Abram, Isaac, Jacob. And I appeared to them as Al Shaddai. But my name yod Hey vav Hey was not revealed to them, not known to them. First of all, sometimes... It seems that using the true name of God is harmful. <laughs> when, when Moses proclaimed the true name, there was harm and, and burdens added to the believers, to his people, to Israel. Going around, walking around in this world system using the true name sometimes brings hardship and persecution and scorn and judgment. And, but at the end of the day, that is, it, it, it just looks like it brings burdens because the actual key to real deliverance and to real life for Israel, for the people of God, Yisrael, overcoming with Yah, uh, overcoming with El, time will show that deliverance is in that name only. We've looked at so many passages. Remember when, when Peter in the book of Acts received the Holy Spirit, he said, Everyone who calls on the name of yod hey vav -Hey will be saved. It doesn't mean we're going to have heaven on earth while we're under this Pharaoh Egyptian system. Salvation is something we are looking forward to. It's to, it's to inherit that kingdom that's coming. Let your kingdom come. It's not established yet. His kingdom is and has always been, but Currently, this world system is under the burden and under the authority of the enemy. We handed that over in the Garden of Eden. You will be in charge of everything and you'll have authority over the fishes of the sea and the beasts of the earth. But the moment we sinned, we handed over this world kingdom 
to the enemy. And Yeshua says, we, we are not fighting against flesh and blood. We are fighting against this enemy. And this enemy even wanted to give Yeshua everything. He said, look at all the kingdoms of the world. I'll give this to you now. Just bow down under my authority. And Yeshua said, no, it's not time yet. Don't um, tempt God. It's not time yet. Because he first had to pay for the bride with his blood. And then when he comes back the second time, he's going to take his bride. And he is going to destroy this system and establish his own but when God said that he didn't introduce himself as yod heh vav to um, Abram, Isaac, and Jacob, his covenants with Abram, Isaac, and Jacob um, as El Shaddai, the mighty one, um, he, he is El Shaddai. El means God or mighty one. And Shaddai, it's got various meanings, but it, it's got to do with the all-powerful um, God that never changes, that's in charge of everything and is outside of time and space and dimensions. Whenever you see Lord, L-O-R-D, um, in your Bible, in capital letters, that is how the translators, well, I'm not going to talk about that now, but uh, how they write yod heh vav Wherever yod heh vav um, is in the original Hebrew, they've, they've changed it to Lord. Wherever Elohim or El is, they've changed that to God. So the word Lord appears all over the Old Testament before the time of Moses. God has spoken to Abram, Isaac and Jacob under many names. El Shaddai and um, I'm your provider and I'm your shepherd and I'm your almighty one, I'm your creator. But but the word Lord, yod heh vav does appear. Um, but in the Bible, a name signifies an attribute, a character, or a prophetic destiny. God was, it looks like he was telling Moses that he had revealed his attributes of El Shaddai to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. But he hasn't revealed the attributes of his name, yod heh He had not yet shown them bef- before um, yeah, their seed, their descendants are under huge persecution. Abram, Isaac, and Jacob weren't there in the same sense as their seed. He had not shown them the full meaning of this specific name. Remember, Yod, Hey, Vav, Hey, Behold the Hand, Behold the Nail. They knew him as the great, mighty, awesome, and all-sufficient God. They even knew him as the God who made great promises, but they never had the opportunity to get to know him as the God who fulfilled those promises. Remember, your descendants will be as the stars in heaven. Neither Abram, Isaac, or Jacob saw so many millions of children. But here, Moses is speaking to those stars in heaven, those hundreds and of thousands of descendants of Abram, Isaac, and Jacob as the one that is fulfilling the promises he made to Abram. Your seed, your descendants will be so many. Isn't that exactly the, the, the very thing that is uh, bothering Pharaoh so much, he continuously say, these people are many and they are going to stand up against us and they're going to overpower us. Let's kill the babies and let's kill them with heavy labor. And, um, you know, th- they are too many for us because finally the promises God made has been fulfilled. The patriarchs um, even knew God as the one that made promises yet not seeing the promises in the physical. But Moses, on the other hand, was about to experience the power of the mighty right hand of this God who keeps his promises. He was about to see what it looks like when God fulfills his word. Because he says over and over again, and we'll we'll get to that in detail now, with a mighty right hand and an outstretched arm, I will do great wonders. So, so this is the God that is now proclaiming and, and, and teaching Moses and Israel that his name is I am who I am. And his name is Yahuwah, yod heh He's teaching them another side of his amazing character. And he continues in verse 4. I have established my Brit, my covenant. Remember Brit? That's also the root word for Bereshit, Genesis, in the beginning. It's got to do with the promise of bringing people back to God's house. 
back to his kingdom, back to his place, back to the beautiful Jerusalem where he is going to rule and reign as he intended, back to the Garden of Eden, his foundation of his kingdom, Brit, covenant, Bereshit, in the beginning. Everything has got to do with going back to the roots, going back to the tree of life. So this covenant is what I established with Abram, Isaac and Jacob to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, where they were strangers. Yes, we, we, were str- we are strangers today. They were strangers as well because originally we lived there. We lived in paradise and yet because of our disobedience to his covenant, to his instructions, to his warnings, we lost that. Maybe it's time for you to go back a little bit to Genesis 3 and just revisit those sessions. Just listen to those sessions again. Work through them. Understand how we lost that original covenant, that original Brit, that original house kingdom where we lived with peace. And I mean, there was there was no tears, no sweat, no cold, no economic Pharaoh Egyptian system. Um, and and this is the the covenant God makes because everything He does, from Genesis to Revelation, is to bring people back to the Garden of Eden, bring people back to His kingdom. So we've been strangers for such a long time because originally that was our place to live there with Him was our house. We lost it. We became strangers. We became pilgrims all over the earth, scattered into every corner of the earth. We are strangers to this land, but it is part of his covenant. It's part of his promise. This is what his children will inherit. In the physical, Israel inherited it for a while until they started worshipping other gods again. And they lost it and God um, exiled them to Babylon and Assyria. And then we've, we've got all that history. But this promise is an everlasting promise. And we can read about it and we can see that he fulfilled it and he tried to keep his people on the right path, but we strayed away. But that it doesn't mean that his covenant is now thrown away or forgotten. No, God continuously say all over the prophecies for the end times, I will remember my covenant. I will never forget my covenant. I am going to bring you back. Even Yeshua confirms when he says, this is the blood of the new covenant, when he gave the fourth cup of wine. This is the blood of the new covenant. And the new covenant is described in Jeremiah 31, prophesying that God will scatter, uh, but regather um, Israel. And this time the covenant will be written on their hearts so that we don't make the same mistakes Israel made when the covenant was written on stone. All right. Um. Verse 5, and I've also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, who the Egyptians keep in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. He's talking to you today, 2020. We are um, groaning under the bondage, currently, especially now that our businesses are being restricted to the worst sense. We, we, cannot, we cannot work, we cannot move around freely. We have to bow down to the authorities that's telling us what to do. And, and, and we are groaning under this burden. And God says, yes, you are groaning under the burden. I can see that. You are not, um, I'm not ignoring you. But you, but you have to also understand that I am going to remember my covenant. And as in the first Exodus, I, I have to destroy this kingdom with my plagues and I'm going to bring you out and I'm going to take you through the wilderness and, and just be patient. Let your obedience teach you patience and trust in me. I'm not going to forget this covenant to you, oh South African or um, Australian or American, that, that is so many years after the first exodus, there will be a greater exodus. Um, oh, where is that verse now? I think it's in the book of um, Jeremiah um, that says, um, God is almighty and no longer will they say the God lives who brought up Israel out from Egypt. But they will say, God lives, who brought up Israel from every corner of the world back to the promised land. And we need to remember that, Brit, to keep us standing strong during the tribulation 
and the bondage that we are currently under. Therefore, say to the children of Israel, I am Yahuwah and I will bring you out. Listen, don't forget. I'm not forgetting my covenant. Please, you must not forget my covenant. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians and I will deliver you out of their bondage and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments and I will take you for a people and I will be your Elohim and you shall know that I am Yahuwah your Elohim who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. There's a couple of promises here. Right, and you need to understand, and I, I really hope that you've listened to the teaching that I've placed on our YouTube channel, Two Trees in the Garden. And if you haven't, um, you know, you can WhatsApp me zero eight two eight nine double three eight two six, because the Passover, the Pesach that that we celebrate, oh. <laughs> We celebrate that because that's how God brought us up out of Egypt. Every year, we as Messianics, as well as our older brother Judah, we celebrate the festival of Passover and unleavened bread. God gave these biblical festivals to his people as a remembrance of his great salvation from Egypt. Not just once in history, but also prophetic for us for the future. Gentile disciples of Yeshua celebrate this festival because we now share the common inheritance with Israel. We come into the commonwealth of Israel, says Paul. We are rooted back, we are grafted back into the olive tree. And we and we discard Easter and we start selling, celebrating Passover. The story of Passover teaches us everything about the death and the resurrection of Yeshua. And the deliverance that he brings, this Lamb of God, with his blood against the doorposts. During the Passover um, celebration, on the first night of the festival, on, um, on, on Pesach night, um, we have a holy commemoration and, and we celebrate it with a special meal. In the days of the Holy Temple, people sacrificed the Passover lambs, just like they did in Egypt. And they roasted them and they ate them at this dinner. People still do the same today. We don't physically have lambs anymore. We have to go to the butcher and we buy a piece of lamb. And we also roast it on fire and we have our Passover meal. The meal is called a cedar. And the cedar, um, the word means to set, uh, it's a set order. It's an order of procedure. And you'll, you'll see now how beautiful that is. It refers to the set order of ritual foods and um, wine, cups, right? Um, that is um, composed to, f to fulfill all the different steps of redemption out of Egypt. Um, because you'll see, as we go through this whole process, you'll see the, the, the specific steps in the, this whole redemption um, procedure. During the course of the cedar, the people participate in drinking four cups of wine. Some people drink grape juice. Um, the Jewish people drink wine. Uh, we specifically in the church, um, I never believed in wine until I started um, reading about the feast and reading how the disciples and Yeshua and everybody celebrated. And we are not um, um, drinking a lot of alcohol, but, but the wine is, is so symbolic and so beautiful. And a lot of people are feeling so guilty. They think they must just drink grape juice. But God made wine. He says, um, be joyful in the celebrations. Drink the wine. Um, and and um, it's fermented. It's, it's normal um, red wine um, that we drink. It doesn't have to be grape juice. But some people prefer grape juice, and that is also good. It's still the fruit of the vine. But nevertheless, that's another story. So each of the four cups of wine during the course of the cedar that we drink, right, has specific meaning and purpose. The first cup is called the cup of sanctification, it is the cup by which we declare that legal separation of holy time from normal time, God's time from world time, thereby setting apart, making holy the festival time for God. Um, it's in honor of, of God that, that we drink this. 
The second cup is called the cup of deliverance. We drink it in honor of the deliverance out of Egypt and also our deliverance out of sin and the prophetic deliverance of the physical Egypt where God is going to take us out of this world system and put us into his kingdom. Deliverance, deliverance, deliverance. The third cup is called the cup of blessing. Since it accompanies the thanksgiving blessing that comes after the meal, the cup is also called the cup of redemption because we are to remember how God redeemed his people. He delivers you out of Egypt and he redeems you by the blood. He, he redeems you not only from Egypt, but from the angel of death and from, from sin and from destruction and from judgment that is to come over those who are not under the blood. The fourth cup is called a few different names because it is drunk after um, you sang a couple of psalms and hymns and um, at the end of the meal, some people call it the cup of praise. And um, so, so these are the four cups of the Passover meal. Now, um, Yeshua's last supper with his disciples was a, a Passover preparation meal. He gave his cup to his disciples and he told them, remember, because he, he said he, take, he took the last cup. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, remember me. Right? So how often do we drink that cup? Once a year during Passover. Not every Sunday during Nachmal. It is a specific cup that's got specific meaning for Passover. And he says, <clears throat> he even said they remember, I will not drink from this cup again until I drink it with you in the kingdom of my Father. Because the work of the fourth cup is not yet done. Right? The th the work of the first three cups is done. Right, cup number one, sanctification. I take you back to Exodus 6. I'm going to read to you again the, the verses. So um, now will you see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh? I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. I will remember my covenant with you. I've heard your groaning. I will bring you out. Therefore say to the children of Israel, listen now. I am Yahuwah and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will deliver you out of their bondage. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. And I will make you my people. So there's four promises. Did you hear that? So the first cup we drink on Passover is sanctification. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Cup number two is the cup of deliverance. I will deliver you from their bondage. Cup number three is the cup of blessing, of redemption. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm, right? Yod hai vafai, behold the hand, behold the nail. With my arm, I'm going to save you, but also with my judgments, because that same arm that was crucified, right, is the same arm that is going to judge this world and will bring the plagues and the judgment and the destruction on this world system that's under the um, serpent kingdom. Cup number four is the cup of praise. I will take you for my people and I will be your God. Right. So we had to sacrifice the Pesach lamb. We had to put the blood on the doorposts. We went through all ten plagues. We weren't raptured out, but God br brought us out of Egypt after the ten plagues, after he destroyed the system. He brought us out safely while he also um, protected us during the plagues. Although we were still inside Egypt, we were protected against those plagues, right? So I bring you out um, um, and I save you from the plagues and under the blood you're, gonna, you're going to leave Egypt and you'll get baptized in the Red Sea and then I will make you my people. So I'll redeem you, I'll bring you out, I will deliver you and I, and, and, and I will um, judge them and then I will take you for my people. This happens at the mountain of Sinai. Remember, I've explained to you. Now Moses brings... Israel to the mountain of Sinai and God writes his covenant that he's been making with their fathers. He's now writing that covenant on stone. He's, he's making the marriage covenant. He's writing it on stone. Yeshua says this is the cup of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31. He writes that same covenant now on our hearts. This is how you become God's people. 
So when you when you follow Moses out of Egypt under the blood and you come to the mountain to cut covenant with this God and to accept the terms and conditions of his covenant and also to um, be thankful for the promises that he is giving in his covenant. He doesn't only have terms and conditions. He's got lots of promises. Go and read the Torah. Go and read his instructions, his commandments. It's beautiful. For every commandment, there's a promise. It's beautiful. He, 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 he rewards you for coming into his covenant. So we, we drink these four cups because these are the four promises made in Exodus. I will bring you out. I will deliver you. I will redeem you and I will make you my people. This is the procedure of salvation. Doesn't matter where, in, in which time we live, whether it's 6,000 years ago or whether it's today or whether it was in the time of Yeshua, the procedure is the same. You need to come out of sin, bondage, slavery, oppression, disobedience under the blood. And you, you need to be redeemed by this hand of God out from the judgment that's coming onto this world. And then you need to be taken to the mountain to become his people. And I will be your God and you will be my people. We read that all over the, um, the Bible, all over the New Testament. How many times does Paul remind us of the promises that um, you will be God's people and God will be your God? This is the procedure of salvation. It's absolutely described, like God says, I reveal the end from the beginning. Like Yeshua says, everything that's written about me in the scriptures um, will be fulfilled. It's not a New Testament thing. There isn't a way to be saved in the New Testament that is different from a way to be saved in the Old Testament. Okay, and, and I will bring you into the land, verse 8 concerning which I did swear to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a heritage, because I am Yahuwah. Beautiful promises. I mean, it's mind-boggling how we can trust these same promises. And the fact that God says, I am God, I am yod hei vav this, this name that I'm revealing to you, Start to understand what this is all about and start to trust this name, Yoda Vave, so that you can um, inherit the land and inherit this kingdom in which things are going to be way different to what you are used to. Um, if you just think about the, the short time that Israel had so much peace under the hand of uh, David and Solomon, the kingdom was established and strong and doing well. Yes, until they started becoming disobedient again. But they were doing so well. And that's why God, um, you know, prophesies Yeshua as the, my, my servant, my son David. Because he will rule and reign this kingdom. With the house of Israel and the house of Judah is reunited as one kingdom living in Jerusalem. That is God's kingdom. But if, if you are not accepting this today, don't feel alone. Because... Listen to verse 9. All these promises, all these um, reminders of God's unwavering faithfulness to fulfill his promises. Israel couldn't accept it. And Moses spoke, verse 9, um, to the children of Israel and gave them all God's um, words. But they did not listen to Moses. Why did they not listen to Moses? Read with me. Because of their anguish, of their spirit, and because of the cruel bondage. So if we are going to allow, just like Israel, that the cruel bondage and the difficulty, and you know, bondage for you can be different. For, for some people, it's the economic bondage. For other people, it's um, the religious bondage. For other people, it's the bondage of not not wanting to come out of their comfort zone into this strange new understanding of this God of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Whatever the bondage is, they, they were anguished in their spirit and they couldn't hear. The, the, their spirit was, was groaning and complaining. You know, the people complained all the time. And they, they couldn't hear what God was telling them. We mustn't make the same mistake. 
everything happened happening to the first exodus is prophetic for us for our second exodus for our second passover when when god is going to redeem and deliver us and bring us out and take us back into his kingdom <clears throat> we mustn't make the same mistake where our hearts starts failing because of fear because Yeshua says in the last days people's hearts will melt with fear and many false prophets will stand up and will deceive many and because of the um, increase in iniquity in lawlessness the love of many will grow cold and Yeshua said in the book of Revelation because you um, uh, uh, to that one church you you weren't faithful to your first love but you became um, cold and you know what I'm going to spew you out of my mouth um, there, there's so many so many things that explains to us that we need to trust these promises of God but we also need to come under his authority and, and do his covenant so that he can fulfill his promises but because of fear Fear is a big thing, and it makes that Israel couldn't listen to Moses. They couldn't trust God. God was graceful, and he did start to show them his mighty right hand, right? With all the plagues and turning the blood, uh, the water into blood and all those kind of things. So eventually they learned to trust God. But we see that today as um, our example. We mustn't make the same mistake. mistake. We, 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 we don't have to go through the same um, long process like Israel we need to trust God now from the beginning he's promising that is that he's going to do the same thing and eventually when when the last days start appearing and um, the system wants to force down his mark of the beast and his worship system and his one world government and all those things we need to remember these promises so that our hearts don't fail and and our ears are closed because God says, not only must you circumcise your hearts, but you must circumcise your ears so that you can hear me and trust me. Although when you look with your eyes, things seem difficult and hopeless. But we don't walk by sight. We walk by the Ruach of God. We look into the promises of God for, for what is going to come. And we stand firm and we endure to the end because God says, Yeshua confirms only those who endure to the end will be saved. We have to endure by clinging to these promises. Drink those cups of wine. Bring out, um, redeem, deliver, and I will make you my people. And, and we endure through this and we go through the pressing and the fire and the trials and the temptations and the tribulation. And we have our clothes um, washed white. And we become strong under the tribulation, strong in our faith, although maybe weak in the flesh. Because Paul says, when I'm weak in the flesh, I am strong because now I rely on my God. Let's not be like Israel that couldn't, that couldn't accept these promises. Because they were looking down on the bricks they, have, they had to make. And they were looking down at the stubble that they were... Um, gathering you know the the leftovers of the straw we are not living the abundant life that god has promised us because we are um, we are bent over every day under the burdens of this life and we are just looking at the stubble we, we need to look up god says look up because your redemption is near Sometimes it just takes a moment to look away from your daily grind where you are working in the mud fields of Egypt, stepping on the straw, making bricks. Just look up from that and look up into the sky and remember as the sun comes up every day that he commanded 6,000 years ago so we can trust everything that came out of his mouth because it, it will not change, just like the sun does not change from um, being obedient to that commandment he gave it. So he will not even change one piece of the covenant he gave. Let's get our hearts circumcised. Let's get the covenant written on our hearts. Let him replace the heart of stone with a heart of flesh so that we can listen to his voice. And like he prophesied in Deuteronomy 4, in your tribulation, when you are in the latter days 
and you listen to my voice, I will bring you back from the four corners of the earth and I will gather you again in my hand, the same strong hand with which I'm bringing you out of Egypt. I will gather you again and I will make you again my people. And those who were called not my people, remember, lo ami, they will be called in the last days, sons of the living God, the 153 fishes that the disciples is pulling out of the oceans of the nations. God is gathering his people from every corner of Egypt and is bringing them back to his mountain to cut covenant so that he can take them all the way back to the promised land. Hold fast. Don't waver. Don't lose faith. Don't let your faith um, be stolen from you like the seed that was scattered and um, the parable Yeshua told and the birds came and they stole the seed away before it started to grow. Let your heart be soft and not hard. Do not listen. Listen and obey so that your heart can be soft, so that the seed can fall into the ground and grow and give fruit hundred, hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold, instead of having that seed stolen away by the burdens of this world, like the um, the birds ate up or the the thorns came up and it um, uh, destroyed the seed. Don't allow that. Let the seed grow so that your faith can grow. Because faith is what pleases God and faith is what's going to help you stand through anything that might be lying ahead.